Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 82 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Anne Louise Gittleman, and the topic of the show is radical metabolism. Dr. Anne Louise Gittleman is a New York Times bestselling author of over 30 books on diet, detox, the environment, and women's health. Beloved by many, myself included, she is regarded as a nutritional visionary and health pioneer who has fearlessly stood on the front lines of holistic and integrative medicine. A Columbia University graduate, Anne Louise has been recognized as one of the top 10 nutritionists in the country by Self Magazine, and she's received the American Medical Writers Association Award for Excellence and the Humanitarian Award from the Cancer Control Society. I've been a big fan of her since the time my own health journey first began over 20 years ago when I read her book, Guess What Came to Dinner? Parasites and Your Health. At the time, the topic of parasites was one rarely discussed in the United States. We did our first podcast together over a year ago, and with the release of her new book, Radical Metabolism, a powerful new plan to blast fat and reignite your energy in just 21 days, I wanted to have her back on the show to share more of her immense knowledge. And now, my interview with Anne Louise Gittleman. I have so been looking forward to this discussion today. You were on the show over a year ago, which is hard to believe that it's been that long. And I'm so excited today to hear about you from the perspective of your new book, Radical Metabolism, to hear about metabolism, weight loss, and nutrition. You are a virtual encyclopedia of valuable knowledge and information. And I really appreciate you being here today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. It's a pleasure to be with you, as you know, because I enjoyed meeting you. Was it last year when you came to my home for dinner? We had such a nice time. We did. That was phenomenal. So you are the creator of the Fat Flush and well known for your work in the realm of diet, detox, and nutrition. So what was the catalyst for you to write a book on metabolism, weight loss, and energy? What's different about radical metabolism? Uh, what's different is I was frustrated. I was getting more frustrated than ever, ever since Fat Flush was published, which was way back in 2002. And what I've learned is that many individuals who are doing everything right still have a very no to slow metabolism. They've got issues with their thyroid, no gallbladder, problems with autoimmune illnesses. So I wanted to create a book that would help them metabolize food better, Get, get them energized, number two, and then deal with their autoimmune issues, number three, which I think could be part and parcel of the me metabolic slowdown. And it has to do with the thyroid, it has to do with the gallbladder or lack thereof, and bile, the missing component, the missing switch is bile. And that's so important, especially for your audience. Absolutely agree. I was never a fan of the show, The Biggest Loser, because I felt like it sent the message that overweight people had to eat less and work out more, but that's not the full story. So with so many people today that are focused on dieting, focused on exercising, and some of them hardly eating anything at all, why are we growing fatter and sicker than ever in history? Because I think toxins are out there. We live in a toxic day and age. I mean, this is not your mother's environment. It's certainly not your grandmother's environment. All of the toxins that are in the environment really necessitate three livers to metabolize and to neutralize. So the reality is that if you have a toxic metabolism, you've got the element of estrogen dominance that surrounds us. You've got parasites that are assaulting us from food, from drink, from the air. Sometimes you can actually breathe the dust of parasitic eggs. And then you've got the element of the electropollution, the EMFs. All of this impacts your system on a metabolic and a biochemical level. I absolutely agree. We're on the same page. I think toxicity is the biggest factor in all of the chronic conditions that people are struggling with today. Oh, what and, are and, here's, and the other thing, and let me just say this, and the problem is, 
it's something that I have faced in my own life. If you do not have the ability to detoxify, as so many immunosuppressive people don't, I mean, then what do you do in order to get rid of the toxins? So you have to be guided to do that, which is what we do in radical metabolism, step by step, because many of us have genetic variations, you know, on our detox MTHFR, for example. So one to two, even three pathways could be blocked out of the four. I'm one with three to four pathways blocked. So if I can do it, anybody can do it, can get well, feel great, and then really win the war against losing weight or gaining weight as well as improving metabolism and warding off any kind of autoimmune illness or at least controlling them and mitigating them so the symptoms are not so devastating. What are, from your perspective, some of the telltale signs of a toxic metabolism? Toxic metabolism, those of us that have any kind of small intestine bacterial overgrowth could, should, could, could be toxic, could show up as a toxic metabolism, the lack of HCL, too many toxins overloading the detox process, problems with bloating, I would say, intermittent diarrhea, constipation, problems with your period if you're still having it, premenopausal symptoms, postmenopausal symptoms, menopausal symptoms. Problems all around that you may not even connect the dots to. We see a lot of issues with the skin, for example, that may show the results of a toxic metabolism. Eczema and psoriasis are simply two of those. So I don't think there's any bodily system or cell or organ of the body that is not impacted by the overflow of toxins. We live in a sea of chemicals. Absolutely agree. It, it is challenging to be healthy in the environment that we have created, sadly. Um, so fortunately, we've got people like you out there that are kind of putting the steps together in a book like Radical Metabolism to help us navigate the challenges that we have. So many people today have issues with insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity, even diabetes. What do we need to know about optimizing blood sugar and getting our fasting glucose levels down? What is metabolic syndrome and what role does insulin resistance play in our less than optimal metabolic function? And then how do we fix it? Well, the, the problem here is that you need to understand one thing, and that is that your diet is fueled by fat. We are fat-burning organisms. It's not fueled, or your body, I should say, is fueled by fat, not sugar. That means that you need sufficient amount of fats to keep the fat cells fueling. You need that for your mitochondria. You need it for the cell membranes. You also need a, a moderate amount, not over, not under, a moderate amount of protein, the Goldilocks amount, so to speak. And having those two nutrients together will stabilize blood sugar. Insulin can be your friend if it's working properly, but when you have highs and lows so frequently, your insulin receptor sites can get overloaded and get tired, and that can lead the way to insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome. We used to call it syndrome X. It's very prevalent today in many of the autoimmune illnesses that we're facing. So modifying and moderating and regulating blood sugar is number one. You do it with foods, with your fat, your protein. You do it with nutrients like the long-lost nutrient, which is none other than chromium, up to 1,000 mcgs a day. That's very important. L-carnitine, D-ribose. There are many different ways to work with insulin, but the most important is to use the, the right kind of fats, the essential fats, not just coconut oil and MCT oil, because that's very important for stabilizing blood sugar. And that's a key. That seems to underlie any metabolic problem that we're having, and is a key also to mitigating and solving many of the autoimmune symptoms that people are suffering from. I'm loving this so much already. I can tell the encyclopedia is open and the information is flowing. So this is great. I'm just on a roll because fat is where it's at, but it has to be the right kind of fat. And of course, the message with all these ketogenic diets and the, the ketogenic, the paleo diet, the other one is the primal diet. I think they're on the right track, but the source of fats is not adequate. You need essential fatty acids, not just the saturated fat, the good saturated from the coconut oil, which is not pure poison. Thank you to the Harvard professor that put that nonsense Thank out. You. It's pure gold. Thank you. So talk to us about genetics versus epigenetics in the realm of metabolism and weight loss. What are the epigenetic factors that are influencing our metabolism and what should we do to optimize our gene expression? Well, your DNA is no longer your destiny. You can determine your destiny. And how do you do that? By overriding any preconceived notion of hypoglycemia, diabetes, cardiovascular uh, events, as well as Alzheimer's. And you do that with lifestyle habits. What are the lifestyle habits? The right diet with plenty of the essential fats from omega-6, the good omega-6s 
like I have right here. Yay, this is hemp seed oil. We'll talk about that shortly. You do that by thinking the right thoughts because there's a there, the mental aspect is so important in terms of what your body does, as well as exercise. So anything that you can do to change your lifestyle will actually change the expression of genes, and that's where it's at in this day and age. So you're not your genes. You are your how shall we say that you determine your destiny and your biology is not your biography anymore. And I think that's such an important message because unfortunately so many chronically ill people look into their genetics and they find these mutations and they lose hope that they can get better. And so that message is so critical because our genes do not determine our destiny from a health optimization perspective. No, they don't, but they do give you an idea. Look, I have, I'm going to give you an example because I work with genetic decoding all the time. I actually work with an expert that does that on a personalized basis, which is very interesting. The reality is I have three of the four pathways blocked. I am homozygous on 1298, heterozygous on 677. I have three out of four. Most of my people have one out of four, two out of four, but three out of four, I have to work very hard to detoxify. So a lifestyle that's healthy is not an optional uh, event for me. This is something I do on a daily basis. And it means for those of us that don't detoxify well, we take many amounts, baby steps of all the nutrients to detoxify and to neutralize the poisons. Less is more. In the book, you talk about the three fat burning tissues, brown fat, muscle, and microbiome. What role do each of these play in creating a radical metabolism and why are they so important for our own? Well, they're all important because they help you to metabolize calories for energy. So what's important with the brown fat, it's a, it's a type of fat that's very active with mitochondria. That's why it's called brown fat. And it uses GLA, like hemp seed oil, and even primrose oil, sesame seed oil, and even ghee, which is a high omega-6 fat. It uses that for energy to help metabolize. Your muscles are an innate calorie burner, as we all know. And they're also, they're also really uh, enhanced with the use of chlorogenic acid, believe it or not, which you can find in the right kind of coffee. And then number three, which you mentioned, is the microbiome. We now know from some of the research that was done in Nature magazine many, many years ago that a skinny gut is a skinny waistline. So there's a real connection between the type of bacteria that you have and what your metabolic rate will be. And you can control each of those fat-burning tissues. That's the beauty of getting into a radical metabolism. So let's get into your five radical rules to rescue metabolism. And you talk about these in the book, and I recommend people get the book and look into it. We're just touching the surface of these today. The first one is revamping your fats, then restoring your gallbladder, rebuilding your muscles, repairing your gut, and reducing your toxicity. So let's talk about each of these in a little more detail, starting with revamping our fats. As I understand it, we need to avoid heated, oxidized fats. We need to know that those things are not good for us. But we do need to incorporate healthy omega-6 and some omega-3 into our diet. So I like to use sunflower and flax oil personally. I know you're a big fan of hemp, which you've talked about just a little bit already. So tell us about the health-promoting omega-6 oils, which most people think of as things to be avoided, and that's not true. Yeah, because all omega-6s are not created equal. Look, heat, air, and light are enemies of all omegas, not just the omega-6s, but the threes as well. So you want the unheated, unaltered, unrefined. Hemp seed oil is the highest in GLA, our missing omega. Omega-6s, so it's also the structure of your cellular membrane, because the most amount of fat in your body is in the cellular membranes. That's important. It's constructed of cholesterol, a little bit of the omega-3s, but mostly omega-6s. When we do omega testing, this is what's deficient, the GLA. So you need good omega-6s. And one of the most important omega-6s, and I hope you read this in the book, is the pine nut oil. Well, it's incredible because it's very healing for the entire digestive tract so that if you have any irritation or corrosion of your esophagus, of your tummy, of your small intestine or large intestine, this will heal it in as little as three weeks. It's totally remarkable. Ask anybody that's tried a teaspoon three times a day, a half an hour before meals. So talking a little more about omega-6 fats and how important they are in terms of improving our mitochondria, the energy centers of our cells that really help us do all of the things that our body needs to do. Omega-6 oil is also important in energy, vitality, in terms of even burning fat. So 
have we gone too far in terms of avoiding omega-6s? Yeah, because there's a ridiculous, how do we say this? Um, because I bust that myth in the book. There's this ridiculous concept that omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. They're only pro-inflammatory if they're heated and oxidized and full of chemicals and GMOs. If you get the unaltered, unheated variety, free of chemicals, cold press, then they're really good for you. They're high in linoleic acid, which used to be known as vitamin F in the 60s. It was in all the nutrition books. You need your linoleic acid. And when we do testing of omegas, omega-3s, everybody's on the bandwagon with, but they've not gotten on the bandwagon with omega-6s. It's very deficient. If you have a problem with your skin, get these some omega-6s, bathe in it, put it on topically. It is the best thing for eczema and psoriasis, as well as any kind of dermatitis that you have not had any resolution for. And what I've seen with a lot of testing is that people are so focused on the omega-3s and avoiding omega-6s that a lot of times we're omega-6 deficient and have too much omega-3, or at least the ratio is not what we would ideally want. Ratio is totally whacked up. It needs to be four to one. Remember this, everybody. This is indelible. Four to one, not negotiable in favor of omega-6. Okay, sometimes three to one, but it's usually four to one in favor of omega-6. The reality is you need four times as much omega-6 as omega-3. That's an important myth that, that has been out there that you need more omega-3s and they've ignored omega-6s. So that's not true. You need the omega-6s and you start adding it to your diet. Your skin starts to get a glow, starts to be toned and taut and tightened in a very short time, in about two weeks on this program. Wow. You focus a lot in the book about the importance of cell membrane health or membrane medicine, that our cell membranes are made up of, of lipids, of fats, and phosphatidylcholine. So is the fact that fats make up our cell membranes another reason why we need these healthy fats in our diet? And which healthy fats? You've talked about them some, but what are some of the healthy fats that get your seal of approval? Seal of approval that'll seal your membrane, more important than our membrane medicine, are the hemp seed oil, the pine nut oil, the sesame seed oil, pine nut oil, sesame seed oil. Uh, if you can get the sunflower oil that's unprocessed, unrefined, unaltered, you've got sunflower seed oil, safflower oil, unprocessed, unrefined, not the one that's been made into a... Um, a cook, a cooking oil, because that's, sometimes that's what they do, but not the oleic acid transferred uh, safflower oil, but the unaltered safflower oil, as well as the, the grass-fed butter is also a source of omega-6s. So that's why a little pad of butter from a grass-fed cow, one that doesn't do drugs, is very good for your nerves, <laughs> your myelin sheath, and your membranes. I say bring back membrane medicine bathe in this, put it on topically. It is most magnificent and we're very deficient, which is why in the first, it's the 21 days and then we have a four day cleanse. In the first aspect of the diet, we do without any of your coconut oil. I want you to replenish your stores of omega-6s. That's how deficient we are and that's how vital this is. When we think about our cell membranes, you've pointed out that sugar activates enzymes that destroys our membranes. And that's another reason why the radical metabolism diet avoids sugars, processed foods, and also soft drinks and fruits and grains and so on. So tell us a little more about the impact of sugar on our cell membranes. Well, so the, the enzyme, it creates an enzyme which does destroy the cell membrane, but sugar is just a toxin, period. You know, if we were just taking in two teaspoons a day of sugar, it'd be fine, but not the great amount that we're taking in. We have learned from a lot of the cancer studies that cancer is flu fueled by glucose and it's spread by fructose. So we eliminate those sources of glucose and fructose from the diet, which is why fruit is actually limited on the program, not completely eliminated, limited, certainly no glucose. And sugar is not good to feed bacteria or yeast or parasites or fungus. So it's really a no-no because of what it does to the system. If you didn't have these underlying causes or this great load, great load of toxic uh, toxic chemicals and so forth and toxins, then you probably could could get away with a little more than what people can get away with now. But now you have to starve the yeast, starve the fungus, starve the protozoa, starve the worms, and you do that with no sugar and no fruit, P.S., for those of you that are really autoimmune sensitive or have an autoimmune problem that, are, that is not being resolved. You do without any sugar or fruit for two weeks.
Talk to us a little bit about the fish oil versus seed oil debate. Well, fish oil is very healthy. If, of course, it's molecularly distilled pharmaceutical grade, uh, that's healthy for the system, I believe. Seed oils are high in omega-6, so you need a combination of both. It's as simple as that. Let's move on to your next radical rule, which is restoring the gallbladder. So we've talked about how important fats are for the cell membranes. They're important for brain health, for the creation of hormones, our immune system, <coughs> our energy. If we don't optimize our bile production, we can't really break down and utilize these healthy fats that we're bringing in through our diet. So how do we support the gallbladder and then optimize our bile production so that we can actually utilize the fats that we're taking in? We do this with bile salts if you don't have a gallbladder. Bitters if you don't want to use bile salts. If you're a vegan, for example, there are lots of bitters like Dr. Shade's Bitters Number 9 on the market. You make the bitters in the book. Or you take a lot of bitter foods in your program. Arugula, grapefruit, uh, thyme, watercress. Uh, tons of fruits, tons of vegetables. It's all in the book, of course. And you do this on a regular basis. Even lemon and lime and lemon zest and lemon peels are bitter. So that when you go out for a drink, a little lemon zest or, or ag Angostura bitters. Bitters are where it's at in terms of prompting the bile to be released and helping the digestive flow. Bitters are the, are the catalyst for HCL. So if you don't have enough hydrochloric acid, your gallbladder doesn't work properly. So bitters are missing from the diet, just like the omega-6s are, which prompted me to write this book. we got to put them back on your dinner plate. What is the role of bile and the connection to metabolism? So what are some of the clues that people can also look for that might make them suspect that they have a problem with their gallbladder and their bile? So first, the clue. The clue is that the breakdown of fats triggers an enzyme that is able to transform T4 into T3, basically. And that's been found in research out of Finland and Harvard Medical School. In terms of what you look for to see that that connection, the bile and the gallbladder holy alliance is working properly, if, you, if it's not working properly, you're very bloated, you're very gassy, you've got problems with under the rib cage, the right side of your ribs, you've got problems as well with light or clay-colored stools, you've got problems with constipation. One of the things that we notice when people take my, I have a, a product called Bile Builder, which helps <clears throat> produce it gives you the bile salts, gives you a little choline to break down fats, a little taurine as well. And what we find is that people can now go to the bathroom. Getting your bile produced properly, thinned out and flowing adequately is one of the best natural laxatives known to ban, certainly much better than fiber. So a connection that you made there that I don't think most people think about was connecting bile to thyroid, to autoimmune disease, to Hashimoto's, which a lot of people are dealing with. And so if we focus on the issues with bile, then are we potentially helping to support Hashimoto's, for example? Are we reducing that issue? You are, because Hashimoto's, as well as Graves, I believe, may be an example of toxic overload, some sort of infectious agent which is affecting your whole system. I don't think that your body attacks your thyroid. I think a virus may be attacking the thyroid, or a metabolite from um, fungus may be attacking the thyroid, or some sort of parasitic infection could be at, at the root of it. So that when you have enough bile produced, it also flushes the system. It's a detox method of the liver. And that in and of itself will reduce the symptomology of any autoimmune condition, including Hashimoto's. So yes, I think that that's connected. And there's a few other little tidbits that we talk about in the book, especially for those with Hashi. When we talk about gallbladder and bile, we know now that bitters are really important. Would you say that most people should incorporate some type of bitters before their meals? All people. <laughs> All people. We've got a bitter receptor site on the tongue. It's just a forgotten flavor, but it's very well known in the Oriental cultures. You'll find that in Ayurvedic. So I think what's important is that you learn to love the bitters. And I give you different lists for the vegetables, the fruits, the herbs, the spices, even the oils that can have a little bitter flavor. So bitters are back. You can make your own metab elixirs in the program. You can go out and have a drink like those Angostura bitters that I was talking about. You can do it breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, and even when you're out on the road. Awesome. You talk about bile acids being 
almost like a dish soap. So the bile acids, the bile salts that they're actually helping to clean the gastrointestinal tract. I've heard some people suggest that the impairment of bile and the impairment of that flow could potentially be a factor in SIBO, which is becoming a really big issue for people. So besides bitters, what are some of the other things people can do to optimize the production of bile? Are there some other nutrients that might make sense to incorporate as well? The nutrients which could help would be lecithin, which can thin the bile. Lecithin is not a real soy product. It's an element derived from soy, but if you get the non-GMO soy lecithin, it's very helpful. It certainly has brought down cholesterol in many individuals back in the day. So you got your lecithin, you've got your choline, which is so important for defatting a fatty liver. 500 milligrams three times a day, it's included in one of my supplements, the Bile Builder. You've got beetroot, which is another helpful adjunct in bile, promoting bile production. Uh, And then you also have taurine, very important as well. And it's also a heavy metal chelator. So there's lots to be said for the nutrients that can help in bile production and bile detox. It needs to be free flowing, it needs to be thinned out, and that's what the, the element of surprise is. It's one of the reasons that taking a little bit of lemon juice in the morning is so good because it thins the bile, it tones the whole body to work better throughout the day. Coffee enemas are another potential tool that my understanding is can help stimulate bile flow. So how helpful do you find coffee enemas for not only stimulating bile flow, but just for reducing toxicity overall in the body? Once to twice a week, a little coffee. And of course, get the Purity Coffee, which has no mold. You know, coffee is really moldy. I'm sure your, your community understands that. No mold, high in antioxidants, totally pesticide free. I think it can be helpful. A little bit goes a long way. I can only do one or two a week, not more than that. It's very, you can be a little de or enervating for my system. So if you, if your detox pathways are blocked one or two a week, very helpful. It's been known in the cancer circles, the alternative cancer circles for many, many years. Let's talk a little about liver and gallbladder flushes, which I have done many of over the years, but I have been hesitant to really talk about and recommend them for other people if you don't have a doctor that's kind of supervising them. I think there's some potential risks. So what are your thoughts on liver gallbladder flushes? I agree with you, Scott, because if you've got stones and you know about them or not, they can get stuck in the bile duct and create real problems for the pancreas. So you got to be really careful. If someone does not have their gallbladder, which in the Lyme disease community is not uncommon that people have had their gallbladder removed, what considerations are there that are maybe different from what we've talked about so far? Should someone without a gallbladder do the same things that we've talked about, or is there a different approach? No, it's the very same approach the exact same approach, but they're going to need stronger bile acids. And that should be timed during every meal where there are fatty foods that are eaten. That's what the clue is. Beautiful. So moving on to the next radical rule is rebuilding muscles. And that's one of the things even my naturopath just recently told me time to get busy lifting weights. What's the role of rebuilding muscle in terms of our metabolism and weight loss? It enhances metabolism sometimes 24 hours after you exercise. So that's kind of a no brainer that I tell everybody you can all move. You know, if you don't move it, then you lose it. That's number one. But number two, there are foods that you can eat that will help to decrease the possibility of loss of muscle mass. And one of those most important foods, and I consider it a food in many respects, is coffee. I mentioned this previously, but it's worth repeating. The chlorogenic acid really helps to maintain lean muscle mass. There have been lots of studies that show individuals that are inveterate coffee drinkers do not have the muscle loss that many of us experience as we get older, hopefully wiser, but certainly as we get older. So for the muscle benefits, you're recommending that same coffee taken orally? I do. I do. And I was never a coffee drinker, but, but I was compelled. You know, when you see research that's so compelling, I had to do more investigation. I've spoken with the good folks of Purity, and it's quite, quite a story behind how this came to market, number one. But number two, the research is, is incomparable. It's, it's, uh, it's unsurpassable. And they are the highest food and antioxidants on the planet, this particular coffee. Beautiful. Yeah, since we were talking about enemas, I just wanted to clarify for everyone listening that now we can drink it as well. You talk about... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any which way you (laughs) want to take your coffee, we're all for. 
You talk about muscle as a ready-made energy burner. We talked about nourishing brown fat with the omega-6s. Nourishing muscles, we need protein as well. So why is protein so important and what are some of the favorite sources of protein that you recommend? Well, it's fuel for the various amino acids that are so important in providing you with very strong lean muscles. And one of the, and the, some of the amino acids, the branch chain amino acids, come from whey protein specifically. So if you get whey protein from a source that's pure, the non-mutated casein A2 milk, then you're in better shape if you, or if, than if you get regular A1 uh, derived whey. And so that's one of the brands that I put in the the, the book, I talked to you about the Fat Flush Uniki brand that you can get, which is has that very purified A2. That's important, I think, for muscles. Any, any amino acid, you know, maybe 8 to 10 of the amino acids in a supplement for those of you that don't want to take the whey, that's important. But some people do need more protein, especially if they're malnourished, if they've had surgery, or if they're recovering from surgery. So I was going to bring up the whey conversation. So let's just jump into that. So you talked about the difference between whey protein from A1 versus A2 milk. So I don't know that a lot of people are even familiar with that. Maybe you can give us a little more detail. My understanding is that A2 milk or products derived from A2 milk are less inflammation promoting in the body. And we can even get now A2 milk at many whole food stores, for example. So tell us a little about A2 milk. Yeah, well, the research that's been done, you know, if you've read the China study, then you know the casein has been readily connected with degenerative diseases, including cancer. So I, with the, the company that I work with, I'm a brand ambassador for Uniki. We went out of our way to source the A2 milk, which is considered the original milk. I think we get ours from uh, Europe, as a matter of fact. It's either New Zealand or Belgium or Switzerland at this point. But in any event, the A2 has not been connected with a great amount of inflammatory-based diseases as A1, which has been connected with type 1 diabetes, heart disease, and any other kind of cardiovascular incident, as well as problems with stroke. So my point being is if you're going to do your milk, you want it from A2. If it's whey protein, which would be a concentrated source of that milk, then make sure it's A2. Fat flush Uniki whey is the only way I go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh People have been talking more and more to me recently about mTOR and autophagy and how too much protein can actually stimulate mTOR and kind of shut down autophagy or the cellular cleaning mechanism that we have. What are your thoughts about when we potentially get too much protein? And is that an issue with vegan sources of protein as well or plant-based sources of protein? Or is it more of an issue with animal protein? I think it's more of a problem with animal protein. And you know if you're getting too much protein, if in fact your kidneys start to ache, number one, or you take any kind of blood test and you find that your protein levels, your protein values are too high. So you really have to, do, you have to evaluate that on a person-by-person -person basis. You can get too much protein, but quite frankly, I'm seeing people get too little protein. You talk about in the book the importance of all of the amino acids, getting the essential aminos to avoid breaking down our muscle tissue. You talk about how the most complete proteins come from animal products, but that there are some plant-based products as well, soybeans, quinoa, buckwheat, chia, hemp you've mentioned as well. What are your thoughts on the importance of animal protein in achieving radical metabolism? It's easier, but it's certainly not impossible with vegan sources. I have many vegan followers, many raw food followers, so it certainly is doable. And I think we provide enough sources of vegan-style proteins from the hemp foo, <laughs> which is now out, to some of the vegan-style protein powders. So this is much more easier. It's certainly easier now than it's ever been. In rebuilding muscle, are there certain exercises that you think are most important? And is it true that sitting is now the new smoking, as some people are suggesting? Sitting is the new smoking, and it's movement. I think you need a combination of cardio, of stretching, and of weight resistance. I personally, on a daily basis, now do the power plates. Are you familiar with those, those mm -hmm. oscillating power plates? Yeah. So I feel that I'm getting muscle building, I'm getting stretching, stretching and massage on a daily basis for only 10 minutes a day. And so they're, I, they're great for the lymphatic system and detoxification as well. Well, for those of us that don't detoxify the way we should, I think it's very important. But I'm also a big believer with people of my age and stage of life, 40, 50 and above, actually 60 and above at this point. <laughs> I think it's important that you that you do some weight training. I do that on uh, twice a week with a super slow method and a trainer. Beautiful. So the fourth rule is repairing the gut. 
uh, with our modern diets, the assaults on our gut, the glyphosate, all of these things that affect the gut, it really seems that almost everyone has some degree of intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut that can lead to systemic inflammation, immune dysregulation. So let's talk a little about the gut and our biome. People are oftentimes surprised to hear that there are more microbes in us and on us than human cells. So how important <laughs> is our, well, and it's interesting because a lot of times, especially people from a Lyme perspective, they have an idea that we can kill bugs to get well and, and not really realizing that we are more bug than human. So how yeah. important is our microbiome in terms of our overall health? Why does the biome matter? And what are some of the things that you recommend for supporting the biome? Well, it's a secondary immune system, so that should tell it all. Something like 80% of your immune receptors are located in the gut. Very, very important for overall health. I don't think that there's a system in your body that's not related to some function of your intestinal bacteria. That being said, you need about, I think it's about 80% of the beneficial to maybe 20% the unbeneficial. And then what's important in that regard is that on a daily basis, you supplant or you feed the beneficial bacteria, which is where the prebiotics come into play. So in the book, we give you a whole slew of prebiotics and probiotic foods, which are your fermented, your cultured foods. Some people need more, some people need less. Those with a histamine situation maybe need a little less, not so frequently. But I love the sauerkraut, the homemade sauerkraut or bubby sauerkraut in that regard. I love a little natto, maybe a little bit of miso. There are lots of different ways to get your beneficial probiotics in the diet. I think when you look for a probiotic supplement, less is more, which is my newest, my newest mantra. Very important for me to understand that because I used to think if a little is good, a lot is better. So now less is more. But what's important there is to understand, especially for individuals with autoimmune illnesses, as your community can relate, you don't want to have a heavy-duty probiotic, which introduces too much of the beneficial bacteria into an already compromised system. So small amounts of the CFUs, not more than 2 maybe to 10 billion units CFUs in a serving per time, and then do that throughout the day. So we're talking about radical metabolism. We're talking about weight loss. Is it true that the balance of bacteria in the gut influences whether or not we're overweight? And then are there certain probiotics or anything along those lines that can be taken that might support our overall weight management goals? Yeah, I mean, there. This was what nature had come up with. There, there are different kinds of bacteria which make for a skinny gut, a more heavier gut. They're able to metabolize calories more efficiently. That's true. I never like to focus focus on what those particular probiotics of the month are that are helpful in weight management. Because I find out something very interesting. I did a lot of work with blood type theory years ago. One thing that stuck with me is that each of us that has a different blood type has a different allay, a different assortment of bacteria in the gut. So it's better that you eat something that's, that's healthy, a food source, not an artificial source, to get those healthy bacteria in tow. And that's where those cultured foods that I spoke about a little earlier come into play. Even though they have millions of beneficial bacteria, not billions, that's better for the majority of us. That's how we evolved as a human race. When we have leaky gut or intestinal <laughs> hyperpermeability, we can develop more systemic inflammation. We can have more food reactions, lots of other problems that can develop. We know that inflammation slows or is the enemy of detoxification. Uh, food reactions burden and dysregulate the immune system. It can focus on the food reactions or it can focus on doing other things to support our health. So how important is a focus on improving leaky gut to improve our systemic health? And what tools do you find help in terms of the intestinal hyperpermeability issue? I think it's incredibly important. Leaky gut syndrome is an issue with so many of us because of what you so rightly connected. It's, there's a glyphosate problem in this country. It's in almost every imaginable food known to man. So that impacts your intestine on a very gut level. But I think that the most important thing you can do and the easiest thing you can do, and there are lots of nutrients that are out there that we talk about in terms of the glutamines and so forth that are very helpful in repairing a leaky gut. But that's where that oil comes into play. It's one of the reasons that I promote that. That is where your pine nut oil is so helpful in repairing a leaky gut because of the pinoleic acid, the essential fatty acid-like component of pine nut oil that can repair and can actually seal in those little holes in your gut. So I would do something very simplistic because everybody's tried everything else and it hasn't worked.
From my perspective, if you have a systemic health challenge, gluten is is generally a non-negotiable, and I think it should non-negotiable. be non-negotiable. Okay, <laughs> good. We're on the same page. So let's talk then about lectins, which is a little more debated. So what are lectins? Are they an issue for health? Do you suggest avoiding them? You know, I don't think, I think they're important. I think you should consider lectins. They're a proteinaceous protective mechanism that plants put out to protect themselves against invading organisms. And so the most important foods that may have lectins that could be deleterious to your health would be the legumes. So you cook them in a pressure cooker or an instant pot. Grains would be the other issue that I'd be concerned about. And they can also be cooked that way. So you want low lectin foods if you're really sensitive. So instead of having quinoa, for example, high in lectins, uh, then you would take uh, maybe some basmati rice, some Indian basmati rice, or some, um, some millet, and all of those are in our book, or even some organic sorghum. I mean, so there are substitutions you can make. I think it may be important whether it's that big a deal not quite so sure. I'm not convinced. I'm not either. I'm still exploring that one. <laughs> yeah. Your last radical rule for me is probably one of the most challenging, most important, reducing your toxic load. So let's talk about reducing toxicity. We know that we have all of these environmental chemicals, pesticides, all of these modern world exposures. We then know that we've got invisible toxins like electromagnetic radiation, EMRs, yeah. EMFs that are really unavoidable for many people. So which environmental toxins do you think of as the top concern in terms of metabolism, energy, and weight loss? I think the glyphosates may be number one. Number two could possibly be EMFs in this day and age. And maybe a close third could be the nano aluminum. So those are my top three. And those are relatively new to this day and time, quite honestly. So you have to be a little bit more creative in terms of how to detoxify them. That maybe is where some liposomal glutathione comes into play or the anti-inflammatory omega-6s that I talk about. And bile, which is a binder of some of many toxins. We forget that. When people are attempting to lose weight, they often reduce their food intake. They implement the latest diet trend. They might increase their activity and exercise, but they're not thinking about detox. So from a weight perspective, from the body's need to hold on to fat, how important is removing environmental toxins so that the body then doesn't need to hold on to that fat to store the toxicity? Well, that's important. I mean, it kind of goes both ways. And so that when you're detoxing and have a lot of fat, you're releasing all these toxins that become really located into different organs, so to speak. So you want a binder, and I hope that's where you're moving in this question. You want something that can help bind. Um, so what I can say is it's very important. It's very important to reduce your exposure and then to reduce the toxic effects of the detox itself. So that's where the binder comes into play internally. And one of the things that I recently really learned, I think over the last year or so, one of the big areas for me in conversations with Dr. Chris Shade and conversations with Dr. Kelly Halderman is this whole topic that you're talking about in terms of bile. So if we concentrate toxins in the liver, but we don't get them into the bile, into the gallbladder, back into the small intestines to be bound or to be uh, taken up by these binders and thus excreted, we really have a big problem. We're potentially moving these toxins back into the bloodstream rather than into the bile and into the gallbladder. But even if we're getting things to where we have a binder that's really working well for us, if the toxins are not getting into the bile and thus meeting up with the binder, the binder isn't really as efficient. Right. I can't disagree with you. That's Are there right. particular binders that you find helpful? I know in the book you mentioned Takasumi Supreme, which I think is one of my, my <laughs> bamboo, favorites. Kind of our version of bamboo charcoal. Yeah, I love that because my people have done well on that. Love that. I love living clay. I'm a big believer in this living clay. It's kind of a calcium-based bentonite that you take before you go to bed. So yeah, I think I think we do need a binder. Sometimes people use the liposomal glutathione, which is not necessarily a binder, but can help with the detoxification methodology. And fiber, I mean, we've forgotten about fiber. Fiber is the all-time best binder of all. So when we're taking these binders, we 
increase their ability by focusing on the bile. It's, it's a critical piece. We can't just take the binder and avoid Go the conversation the about the bile. Absolutely. And, and for me, that's kind of been something that's really become more into my awareness over the past couple of years. And I think it's an important message. So I appreciate you sharing that. What role do environmental toxins have on hormones, which hormones are in the discussion around radical metabolism. It seems that many people jump to kind of supplementing these high doses of hormones to lose weight as we get older, but is that really the best way to do it? Well, all the hormones come into play. I mean, our cortisol goes downward and that's because of the EMFs, which affect cortisol production. And people don't talk about that. I think it may be the reason so many people are overweight in this day and age. So we've got a cortisol issue and an adrenal issue because of that. We've got an issue because of uh, estrogen dominance, which impacts hormone dysregulation. You've got a problem with leptin, for God's sakes. And what happened with those contestants and the biggest losers, their leptin went south. And so they, they overate after a while, and then they gained weight. They gained all the weight back that they had lost and then some. So every single one of the hormones comes into play, quite frankly, because when you're involved with too much estrogen, you don't have enough progesterone, so then you have to increase dietary sources of the progesterone. It's all part of it, systemic. I would say that systemic inflammation as well as hormone dysregulation are all part of the toxicity picture. What are some of the approaches that you find helpful from not only avoiding toxins, but then to support detoxification of our body burden of environmental toxins? What are your favorite strategies? Uh, it's, it's just what I mentioned. It's the, the new one is the living clay, which is a clay that it absorbs. It's very similar to the Takasumi. It's Takasumi. We've got that. We've got sometimes the coconut uh, charcoal. I think old-fashioned charcoal can work with some people. And I like the bentonite. So I go for the clays and the, the charcoals, quite frankly. And, and then, of course, you've got your, your fiber. You know, And some people do very well with psyllium. If you can get organic psyllium, it's a very good fiber because it really pulls up all those bile acids and those toxins and escorts them easily out of the system. Let's talk a little about the connection between toxicity and cellular inflammation. So can we detoxify when we're inflamed? And since inflammation really helps to reduce or reduces our potential for detoxifying, how important is it that we also focus on strategies for reducing inflammation? You've got to, it, it's part and parcel because you cannot detoxify when you're inflamed. So you've got to reduce that. How do you reduce it? With an anti-inflammatory, the best anti-inflammatory omega-6s. And then that helps in the detoxification process because it shores up the cellular membrane and it actually feeds the mitochondria. So it's a two and two or three in one. What is, you mentioned leptin, so leptin plays a role in weight loss. What is the connection between biotoxin illness from, let's say, living in a water-damaged building, then affecting leptin and thus our ability to lose weight? You know, I don't know a clear connection, and you may know a little bit more than I do, but leptin certainly is the satiety hormone, which is secreted by fat cells in your body. And I would imagine that it becomes dysregulated by metabolites, toxic metabolites from mold or fungus or yeast. Yeah, and that is Dr. Richie Shoemaker talks about that in his biotoxin pathway that when we get exposed to these water damaged buildings that it can affect leptin. And some people will wow. gain 20, 30, 40 pounds in a very short period of time when they have exposure to mold in a water damaged building. And who would have, who would have thunk that, that those two could be connected? But it's, and certainly 50% of the buildings in this country are water damaged. I first learned about you from your book, Guess What Came to Dinner, many, many years ago. So let's talk about how <laughs> parasites impact. And, and, and back then, no one was talking about it. I mean, you really They're were still not talking about it. Let's talk a little bit about how parasites impact metabolism. And what role does this dysbiosis, parasites, SIBO, other microbial overgrowths, what role does that play in our metabolism and our ability to lose weight and to feel better? So your first question is, how did the parasites affect metabolism? Well, if you think of it this way, the parasites eat up all of your nutrients. So many people become very tired, and so they eat more. That's number one. I mean, bigger parasites, the worms love B12. That's why we have such a deficiency of B12 in this country. They love iron. There's a problem with iron. I mean, we either have too much or too little. They love B, B vitamins. They love sugar. And then they prompt you to eat more sugar. So that may be one reason. They're also highly inflammatory. So there's that, uh, that inflammatory response, systemic inflammation. And they secrete all kinds of toxins that actually make you hungry. 
all these kind of um, biotoxins. So from the metabolism of the, of the parasite, from the, you know, it's reproducing in your system, it's going to the bathroom in your system, all kinds of things are occurring. So we have that issue going on. And I also think that there is a kind of a false sense of um, uh, problems with food allergies. A lot of people that have roundworms, I'm just thinking back, a lot of people that have roundworms or giardia, for example, become very bloated because they're not absorbing properly. And um, roundworms particularly can mirror or mask celiac disease because it creates the same symptoms in the gut. So there are lots of problems with parasites, and they are the most immunosuppressive agent in the body. So if you're going to list all the toxins you want to get rid of, that should be number one. What are some of your current favorite anti-parasitic strategies? Getting rid of getting rid of sugar for two weeks, as we discussed with yeast and fungus and mold, two weeks, fruit and sugar for two weeks, having a lot of garlic in the diet, maybe some diatomaceous earth, a tablespoon in your smoothie, and my, my colon cleansing kit, which is the best kit on the market. Many things that are on the market these days were actually... Uh, mirrored after that particular kit, but I studied with many parasitologists, so figured out the best mix of, of herbs and botanicals that wouldn't do in the host while you were doing in, so to speak, and clearing out the parasites. Parakey, Verma Plus, and Florakey. You, and you hit it You hit it for a cycle of two weeks on, five days off, <clears throat> two weeks on, five days off, two weeks on, five days off, maybe two months worth of that cycle. Then you hit it every five days of the full moon, two days before, day of, two days after. You need to get the cycle of the little larva that could be could be growing that you didn't get the first time around and the eggs that are hatching at uneven and irregular times. What does Anne Louise Gittleman personally do to minimize exposure to electromagnetic fields that we're all exposed to in our modern world? Um, what does she do? Let's see. What does she do? <laughs> what does she not do is the question. Um, I use Altura. I use an Altura phone protector on my phone. The Altura plugs, I just experimented with Blue Shield that I just bought for the house. And uh, no Wi-Fi in my house. <clears throat> Everything is corded. Beautiful. So let's talk as we wrap up about the Radical Metabolism Plan. So the details of the, the plan really are spelled out in so much detail in the book. We just barely touched the surface. But what are some of the key points of the Radical Metabolism Plan? We have a four-day cleanse with the right kind of juices, more vegetables and fruit, as well as a watercress soup, which is really good for getting rid of all kinds of uh, water-retentive food allergy responses. We have a 21-day that you'll find is low lectin for those of you that want it to be low lectin and is also uh, filled with options for those that are vegan, vegetarian, or uh, raw foodists. So we've got plans for everybody. And it's simple, it's easy. You start the day with a morning blast, which has coffee. If you're not a coffee drinker, you can use oolong tea or a little dandelion root tea. We've got options for everybody. I think it's a fun program. And people have gotten extraordinary results. A lot of people that have had all kinds of autoimmune illnesses that have been in my test group have found that their aches and pains go away in a short period of time. At least they're greatly mitigated, and that's a blessing. So the plan starts with a four-day intensive to kind of prepare the body for then the 21 day, what you call the radical reboot. So what's the goal of each of these phases, and what might we be incorporating into our routine for each of those phases? So one is liquid, so you're resting your digestive tract and priming the pump for detox for four days. Anybody can do four days. Then there's 21 days to reboot your gallbladder, and that's where all your herbs, your spices, your bitters come into play, your protein, your carbohydrates, your fruits, your vegetables. It gives you an idea of the proper ways that you can combine foods. You don't have to use our menus and our 50 recipes, but it'll give you the blueprint of what to do on a daily basis, moment to moment. And then after you do the four-day intensive and the 21-day radical reboot, how do we maintain the benefits of reigniting our radical metabolism? Well, we give you one week of menus to maintain, and that'll give you an idea and another blueprint for thereafter. But when you buy the book at RadicalMetabolism.com, RadicalMetabolism.com, once again, um, you're going to get some, some gifts and an invitation to our special Facebook group where I'm working with you daily to make sure you're doing the program just as radically as you can.
Beautiful. That's awesome. And I have participated in some of your Facebook groups and it is a great way for people to get information, to see videos from you and to continue learning. So I definitely recommend that people check that out. What are some of the key things that you're doing on a daily basis in support of your own health? What are the key things? I know there's so many things. We could do a whole show just on that, but what are the, the top things that you do in support of your health? Well, on a regular basis, it's not a daily basis. I'm a big believer in colon hydrotherapy. So I do do colon, colon, colonic irrigations and I have a colon unit in my house. I have a, um, you know, a ready-made colonic machine in my house. So I'm a big believer in cleaning out as best you can, number one. And then number two, I mean, I'm, I'm blessed that I have a, a personal chef that I consult with who makes me lunch and dinner every day so that I know that everything is purified, everything is combined properly. I have a special lamp called the Theolite where I detoxify foods under the lamp. Look it up, Theolite, it's sold online, T-H-E-A, light, L-I-T-E. And what else do I do? I take special, I take a lot of vitamins and minerals, a lot of hydro, uh, hyaluronic acid these days for joints, for skin, for moisturization of the, the skin. Uh, as you get older, your, your needs get different, and I'm finding it's really good for the joints. I take a green drink, which is made with the Uniki Daily Greens on a daily basis. I do my parasite cleansing. I hit it five days out of the month with my colon cleanse, and I take BioBuilder. I mean, I do all the things that I write about. You know, I have to walk the walk and talk the talk. I just have to be in alignment with what I'm telling other people to do. And you definitely do. When I had the opportunity to come have dinner at your home, it was so much fun for me because I got to see that you really do do all of these things. And so it's it's really phenomenal. <laughs> you are... You are one of my heroes in this realm. I, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. You have such great information that you share with people. Um, as I've said, you're just a virtual encyclopedia. I, I love you. I love the work that you're doing. And I just thank you so much for spending time with us today, Annalise. To learn more about today's guest, visit RadicalMetabolism.com. That's RadicalMetabolism.com. Thanks for your interest in today's show. If you'd like to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. To support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. If you'd like to be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. And this and other shows can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com.